everyone, and welcome to Intro to the Night Sky. This is an event hosted by the Greater Sudbury Public Library as part of our TD Summer Reading Club. And I am so pleased to introduce to you today Linda from the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, uh, who will be joining us here today to share with us an introduction to the night sky. Uh, I can't wait to see what she has in store for us. If you have any questions for Linda during the presentation, please type them into the comment section of this video, and I'll be sure to make sure that those questions get to Linda. Uh, so thanks for tuning in, everyone, and take it away, Linda. Hello. Good morning. Um, <clears throat> I would like to start with a little bit of an introduction in that I am, as much as I will be sharing with you a fair bit of information about the sky, uh, not just the night sky, um, I am simply a hobbyist. I, uh, it was not my profession. Uh, actually, I'm an old retired nurse, but I took up astronomy close to 20 years ago, and my uh, preference is in visual astronomy. Um, there are other types of astronomy, but I do visual astronomy and I love to do outreach. I usually am teaching with groups, uh, girl guides, uh, scouts uh, in the provincial parks with church groups. So I'm with a number of groups um, to just share the joys of the night sky. I am a member of our local Sudbury, we used to be called the Sudbury Astronomy Club, and more recently we uh, joined in with a national, a large national organization called the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. And again, our mandate within uh, RASC is to um, do a fair bit of public outreach and teaching. So um, I am also a member of the North Bay Astronomy Club, and I've used some of their resources in this presentation because I absolutely love what they put together. Uh, the, there's a lot of really fun guys in both clubs, but in the North Bay Astronomy Club, I've developed some long-standing friendships. We do a lot of camping, and um, we camp together in provincial parks. In fact, I'm leaving this afternoon and going away with them uh, for another star party. Star parties are when astronomers get together, whether it be for one night or four or five together. Um, astronomers get together and take our chances. We, we like to increase the number of nights we're together because that increases our chances of having a clear dark sky. So, um, astronomy does not require a great deal of teaching and you don't require equipment. And I love to push the fact that this is mostly done um, with the unaided eye. If I slip into the term naked eye, bear with me, that's what we used to use all the time. I'm supposed to now say the unaided eye. Um, and binoculars are also a favorite item to go to. So please don't run out and get a telescope and think you're going to see all of the things that I show you today. Let me attempt to share my screen because uh, I'm still a little bit of a novice at this. And I will bring up for you, um, here we are. There we are, I hope you can see that. Um, so again, this is our logo, whereas we used to be the Sudbury Astronomy Club and our, um, our previous logo. I'd like to say that we are part of a huge neighborhood called the Milky Way. This picture of a galaxy is not a picture of our galaxy, the Milky Way. In fact, we have no way of doing that. Uh, we've no spaceships that can go far enough to take a picture of the Milky Way. Uh, the Milky Way is a hundred light years long and we just don't have that kind of technology yet to get that far. But we can, through radio photography and other methods, um, map out our uh, position within our own galaxy and map out our galaxy itself. And it is supposed that we are similar to, our galaxy, the Milky Way, is similar to this galaxy and many others that are a very common thing called a spiral galaxy or a barred spiral. So there's a little bit of a bar in here with this light, and then you can naturally see the spirals. So these spiral arms, galaxies are always spinning, always spinning. They're like congestion lanes as the stars travel around, around that very powerful, massive center. And 
our Milky Way, if we were to map where we are in our Milky Way, let's just, I'm hoping you can see my cursor. Our sun would be way out, only about a third of the way in from an edge, way out here. We are not in the center of our galaxy by any means. So we are a random star somewhere far out, about a third of the way from the outer edge of a galaxy, which is among trillions of galaxies. The count changes all the time with technology. Like, millions of trillions of galaxies. <laughs> so uh, we are relatively insignificant in our position, but nonetheless, it is keen, we're keen to learn. So let's go back to simple and here on earth. If you wanna look at the night sky, I strongly recommend you do a little bit of planning before going out. I mean, you can go out and just look up, but without an aid, a map, you might not be familiar or recognize the things you see. So I have found this to be a very safe website and I get no accolades for telling you about this. Uh, it's just that I have never had any problem with this website. I feel safe to give it to my girl guides and scouts. Um, never had any issue. There's no membership, they don't get back to you. Um, so um, give this one a try if you want a simple map for the night sky. Um, it's at skymaps.com and it's a two page item. The um, when you go to skymaps.com, it says download latest version. And when you click on that, you didn't download a thing. It just brings you to another page. Again, it'll say download latest version. And what you'll get is the current month. So as, whereas this one is way out of date, you'll see that it is way out of date. And when you have the option to print out your map, you, um, you'll scroll way down the page and you can see that you can get Northern Hemisphere maps, equatorial maps. So if you're going to the Caribbean, you can pull out the map according to that area. And there's Southern Hemisphere maps. So when I'm doing teaching of international groups, I can also refer to the um, Southern Hemisphere maps. Um, the map is a one and two page item. So here on the one side of the page is a calendar of events that are happening for the month. So if there's something interesting that you might wanna go out and look at, something that might be a, a photographic opportunity or just a visual opportunity, it's there. Um, and all the symbols, as in any map, all the symbols are down in the corner. The instructions on how to use the map are all written in teeny tiny letters all the way around that circle. Now, when you go to the next page, I always print it two-sided because I, I don't like to waste the paper. But you'll, you notice that on the right-hand side of the page near the top, it says easily seen with the naked eye. These are items that you're going to be able to see that month. You may not be able to see all those items, say, next, you know, in four months from now. So that is a current list for the current month. Um, things that you can see with your naked eye easily. You do not need any gadgetry. If you've got simple binoculars, and I'm talking simple binoculars, um, you just the kind that you go out watching birds with. Um, mine are shoot, 40 years old that I used to use for looking at the loon across the lake at camp. I still use those as my favorite, even though I have three other pair of binoculars. Simple binoculars will give you all of those easily seen by binocular items. And those are all on that map on the opposites on the first side of the page. You've got a small telescope and you certainly don't need a large, big, powerful telescope to see the items on this telescopic list that's below. Those items, most likely, if you were a skilled visual astronomer, you could likely find them with binoculars, even though they're on the telescopic list. Um, so that just gives you an idea. You can keep yourself busy for a few nights following that list. Uh, it's great fun. I really appreciate this night sky list. Um, it also will show you if there's any planets. The first part of the page would show you any planets that might be along the um, the ecliptic or in the sky for you for that night. This is another type of um, sky map. Um, and you can find these in different forms, but they all have the circle and a base. Um, so it's called a planisphere. And um, this is the one that I use. You usually start out with finding out, you know, what time of night you're out. So if you're out at 10 o'clock at night, and then you move the wheel to match your date to the time. So this one suggests that I was out in 
on in May, uh, you know, sort of the middle of the month at 10 o'clock at night. And there's what the sky looks like if I'm facing north or sorry, facing south, there's the sky there. Um, and I would literally turn the whole thing around if I was facing north, facing east, facing west. And then that would be straight up at the zenith. So there's two kinds of sky maps that help you. There are multiple apps that you can use, but if you're gonna be out viewing at night, um, if you're looking at maps of any sort, or if you're looking at apps on your phone, you want to, one, use a red flashlight or a red filtered flashlight. So you can cover it with uh, red duct tape. You can cover it with red nail polish, red marker, uh, whatever you wanna cover your flashlights with if you don't have a red filter already. And you can use your apps from your telephone, but put them on night sky mode where you have no white or blue light showing. And what happens is um, at night, you know how your, your pupils will dilate to let all the light in that can be. So you've now become dark adapted uh, when you're out at night, uh, according to whatever your light level is for wherever you are. But the moment you uh, look at a light in a house, you turn your flashlight, your white flashlight on, or you look at your cell phone, your pupils will constrict and you'll lose that night vision. You'll lose that dark ad adaptation. And depending on the how dark the circumstances were and how dilated your pupils had been, it can take up to a full 20 minutes to become fully dark adapted again. So it's really important to not use white light if you can. And that way you have a better chance of seeing it, whatever the dimmer things are that are up there while you're just plain looking with your naked eye. So if I go to a nice dark sky place, it can look like that. And see the low glow that's there? Well, that would be typical of a little bit of light pollution from a nearby village or town or city. So remember I said, um, you want to be looking with the unaided eye to begin with and just look up, just look at the maps, look at the our star groupings and enjoy the sky as it is. These are pretty fancy binoculars and frankly, I find them way too heavy. Uh, you'll notice how long they are, they're very heavy and they need to sit on a tripod. So there's always a tripod adapter on these, but they do give you great views. And so if you find that holding binoculars are a nuisance, put them on a tripod and see if that'll help you. Usually a good uh, tripod that you use for mounting a camera will work just fine. Here's a small uh, sky, uh, two inch sky watcher telescope. Um, this might be something you'll find in the department stores to start with for when you're purchasing a telescope. And I can tell you, I purchased something like this to start with and it taught me in the first year and a half of using it, everything I did not want to have in a telescope. So um, it'll give you an idea of I would say just don't waste your money. <laughs> Use other people's telescopes, join a club, find a club, uh, have the opportunity to be exposed to other telescopes. This is a lovely starter as well. And you'll notice that this one has a keypad. So there are different types of telescopes that have different arrangements of uses of mirrors and lenses. This is what we call a Smith grain cast, cast uh, a Smith cast grain telescope. The previous one was a refractor. Um, it uses lenses. This one has lenses and mirrors. Um, and this one is automated. The automated ones can cost a fair little bit more, but sure are handy in a partially light polluted sky uh, or if it's partially cloudy. Uh, um, so the automated stuff is not necessary. I frankly don't use them at all, but I'm grateful when there's one, at least one when we're working with a crowd and doing some public teaching. This is my sort of telescope. Um, this is a 10 inch Dobsonian. So it works just with mirrors. And uh, the Dobsonian name comes from the mount. It's really a reflector. So it just has two mirrors and an eyepiece. Uh, very simple, very straightforward. And uh, this is common and provides you large aperture, large light, light collection for looking at very dim objects for a reasonable price. Those are the typical ones that you'll see whenever you go to a star party with other astronomers. I talked about apps. Um, this is, this is a, a, a screenshot from Stellarium. Stellarium is our most uh, uh, very frequently used by um, visual astronomers for planning for when we're going out or even for teaching for what we're doing for the night sky. So Stellarium is free. 
um, it's a free, unless you're like not, it's free for your laptop or for your home computer, but for your um, cell phone, I understand that there's maybe a charge for that, but it's stellarium.org and it's excellent. It is so full, chock full of information. I'm not even gonna begin to go there for you right now, but you can move it around. You can take the, the lines away. You can bring up the art of, of the constellation so that you can actually see the big bear that that is Ursa Major there. You could actually see the woman of Virgo, the maiden. Um, you would actually see the lion. Um, there's so many options for Stellarium, and I just, I like to rec let you know that it's available. This is typical of the uh, winter night sky. When we look straight south, there's Orion. Some of you may recognize Orion. I often hear people say, oh, I know, it's Orion's belt. Well, there's Orion's belt, but when I meet a man, I don't look just at his belt, I look at the whole guy. So here he is, there's the whole hunter, and there's his dog, uh, Canis Major with his very bright star Sirius, which is the brightest star we ever see in the Northern Hemisphere. And he, that hunter, is hunting towards this bull, Taurus the bull. Stellarium will show you, for example, if you'll see Mars, so Stellarium will show you if there are planets uh, in the region at the night sky at that current time. So it's a wonderful app to use. Um, I have sent Katie a um, list of resources and if, you can't get the list of astronomy resources from Katie uh, from the library, then please feel free to connect with the um, SudburyAstronomyClub.com, I believe we are, unless we're .ca, I'm sorry. Um, and you could use our website, just Google Sudbury Astronomy Club and put in a request there for uh, from the Star Lady. You can simply put in from the Star Lady and um, I will send you the, the sheet of resources. Uh, I've got loads of books and magazines and um, apps that can be helpful. I'll also so we don't add, yeah. Linda, the your website to the comment section for everyone uh, who's watching at home so they can find that easily. Uh, and also you are at the 15 minute mark, just so you're aware. Oh, thank you, good. You're welcome. Yep. That's perfect. So I was just going to show, we do look at the moon and love the moon. Look at the features you can see on the moon. This is of course not with your unaided eye, but you'll get used to the large seas and the uh, impact craters and their rays. And you can see this almost that well with just a standard set of binoculars. May I suggest looking at the moon in the daylight hours when the moon is, is visible then, but if you're going to be looking at nighttime, looking at the moon, put on a pair of sunglasses or two and you will reduce your eye fatigue um, because it's awfully bright against a dark sky. So it's really hard in the eyes. I'm going to switch to another PowerPoint and thanks that Katie put, gave me the 15 minute notice. So shake a little and um, let's see if I can find another one here. Any questions so far, Katie? Not yet, Linda. Not quite okay, yet. good. I'm going to give you a little bit of a tour through the summer night sky. So um, I'm gonna see some things that we tend to look at and it gives you an idea of what astronomers look at when we're looking up. Um, this beautiful picture came from um, the North Bay Astronomy Club, which is well labeled there. Uh, they were down at the waterfront and it shows again how we use the different kinds of, of um, telescopes and we just plain look up. When the sky is just like this and we're waiting, this picture is entitled Waiting for the Stars, we can literally see the planets that early before the stars come out. So the first things you see, if they're really, really bright, um, Take a good guess, it could well be a planet that you're looking at. And that's likely what these guys are looking at in this picture. Again, the maps, here we go, the Milky Way. So if you're out in the summer night sky, the Milky Way is really obvious. It's a little bit different in the winter sky. It's not as, I'm um, gonna say as distinct, but it's definitely there. We just don't usually like to go up because it's so gosh darn cold at night in the winter. But in the summer night sky, if you're in a dark sky area, but if you're in a city, you may not see the Milky Way. You may see, you may see it if you're already aware of what it looks like and where it is. But go to a dark sky place and you don't have to go far. Um, for example, in the Sudbury region, I simply go, if we go to even Fielding Park, 
Um, I love going there and, and it'll give you a great view of the, of the Milky Way. But here we go. What's in the summer night sky looking straight up, you'll see three really bright stars. And those three stars are our roadmap to the summer night sky. They are the main stars in Lyra, the constellation Lyra, which is a little musical tool, a musical instrument. The main star Deneb in Cygnus, the swan. And the main star Altair, which is in an eagle. So the swan is flying this way and the eagle is flying north. Uh, if the swan is flying south, I'm also going to turn your brain around and know that different cultures look at different constellations different ways. So as much as um, the 88 constellations that have been named by the um, International Astronomical Union um, are all mostly based on uh, Greek uh, mythology and um, ones in that region. I'm going to tell you, for example, here in North America, uh, this is thought of as a crane. Remember how the crane folds his neck really, really short and half in back when he's flying? So now turn around and think that the bird is flying north, but that's his neck. There's his long legs behind him and his huge wings, which we all know a beautiful crane has got long legs. So whether you're looking at as a crane flying north or whether you see it as a short tail and a long neck of the swan with long wings, it's still, isn't that interesting how in ancient cultures, they all saw it as a bird. And many things have crossover names that are slightly different depending on how people view the sky. Sorry to interrupt, Linda. I think your PowerPoint may be uh, frozen at the moment. If you just want to refresh or reshare the PowerPoint. Oh. Okay, should I stop sharing for the moment? Yeah, maybe stop sharing and then reshare. Okay. And then let's see. Did I stop sharing? You did, yeah. I did? Yes. Okay. And I'll get rid of that. I'll go to this one. Oh, okay, wait a minute. Share screen. Wonderful presentation so far. We have some great comments. Do you? Thank you, Linda, hey. for the great information. <laughs> Very cool. <laughs> Let's see if I can catch up where we were. Uh, I think we're getting there. Okay. Okay, here we go. We can see it flashing right through now. and we have the names of those stars that are the, the triangle, the summer triangle, we call it. So when we look straight up, we see the tail of Cygnus the Swan and there's a little shady area there you can see by binoculars called the North American Nebula. Another one right beside it we call the Pelican Nebula and a nebula is simply a dusty, gassy cloud and uh, it obscures the light from behind and is often lit by stars either behind or within it. And look at this, how the North American Nebula is shaped like North America. See Mexico? Did you see the Gulf of Mexico, Florida, and so on? And there's a pelican there. And I'm only going to try to convince you it's a pelican shape. Oh, trust me, not all nebula are named for what they look like, but this one kind of does, eh? <laughs> So there we go. But you can see that by binoculars. Maybe not as well as this photo, but you can see a cloudy patch there by binoculars. Absolutely. Here's a favorite of mine. If you've ever been with me out observing or if you ever have the opportunity, Brocky's Cluster is a favorite of mine. And I have to tell, it's called, the, the other name is the Coat Hanger, but I must, if I'm working with young people, I have to remember Coat Hangers are no longer um, wooden straight pieces with a hook, they are triangle shape. So I have to tell people it's the shape of an old fashioned coat hanger. Those of us that are older will remember that wooden, uh, ever so slightly curved, but really just sort of a straight line with the hook underneath. And those are stars that are slightly closer, slightly larger, and they are simply in alignment. They are not really clustered together like that, but it is called the coat hanger. So we look at a lot of asterisms or collections of stars like that. What else have we got in the summer night sky? Oh, the wild duck cluster. Now, frankly, I don't see the wild ducks. I think it's a whole bunch of droppings, but that gives you an example of a cluster and what we call an open cluster as opposed to another sort of cluster. And um, that one 
uh, sits along the Milky Way, nice and easy to find. Uh, if you look at south and follow the Milky Way up from the horizon, you will see an amazing number of congested areas of stars like that one we just looked at. Here's another famous one to go after, the Hercules cluster. So um, when we've got the Big Dipper, we arc the handle of the Big Dipper of stars to a star called Arcturus. And then after, but look at that, it's the shape of a kite or an ice cream cone. And when we have that kite or ice cream cone, we're having fun in the summer, so we smile. And this one is called Corona Borealis. So this is called Buodes. And here's our smile, our Corona Borealis, and it points up to, oh my gosh, this Hercules cluster. And there is what we call a globular cluster. So these so, are so intensely compacted together, these stars. Many of these globular clusters are the oldest stars known and, are, um, and then they are making new ones as well. But globular clusters are tight, tight kind of, uh, clusters of stars. Um, and it's very famous in the summer night sky. Easily found by binoculars when you're looking at uh, the map. Alberio is what we call the beak of the swan. Uh, that, and it's a double star. And look at that. Now it was once thought that they were simply, that they were truly a double, that they went around one another. But it has since been proven that these are actually just an alignment. In binoculars, you can tell that it's two stars. And you may even be able to see the two colors. Um, in binoculars, it's nice to see colors. And this is one of those uh, sets of stars where the color of the star does come through, even with my reflector telescope. Um, you may not see it quite that beautiful with binoculars. It could be a little more of what we call averted imagination, but you can tell it's a double set of stars. Alberio is absolutely beautiful. So we look for nebulosities, we look for groups of stars, we look for doubles. And what else do we look for? Let's see what, oh, the ring nebula. So I talked about nebulas being um, clouds of gas and dust, but this one is left over from a star blowing up and finishing its life. So when a star finishes its life, it's burned off all of its hydrogen, then it burns off all of its helium, and it ends up with the heavy metal uh, gases that we, um, heavy metals in their gases. And then it just sort of puffs. So as it's dying, it, it and I mean very close to its death, it starts to puff out a lot of its gas. The dead star is, is within that ring nebula. When you and I see it, when we look up with, um, either with binoculars, it would be smaller than this even, or with a, with a telescope, it'll just be a, a little gray donut. Nonetheless, um, and then you see with, as I said, there were other types of astronomy. And so um, this would be the sort, the magazine picture that you would see, but it's still called the Ring Nebula. It's a beautiful one to witness. Um, so nebulosities can happen from the death of a star. What else is in the night sky? This is my typical tour when, if we're out in the provincial parks, how I miss doing this. The Dumbbell Nebula is also uh, what we call the same as the ring, it's called a planetary nebula. The gases just blew out in their own way. As much as it kind of looks like a little bit of an apple core, uh, after you've chewed out the apple and, and you can see most of the, or an hourglass shape, it's actually a bubble. It's simply the way you look at it. So when we look at bubbles that we blow, uh, soap bubbles, um, that's also what these sorts of things sort of look like, but it's also the intensity of where the, the gases are that are sitting and how they blow in with stellar winds afterwards. So that's a little more the view that you would see through um, a telescope. The Veil Nebula is also from a star dying, but this one is a supernova. So you have to have a pretty large star with a lot of mass in order to have any supernova. So not all stars supernova. They have to have a specific amount of mass, at a minimum amount of mass in order to be able to do what we call supernova. This one blew a heck of a lot of dust and gas everywhere and is still moving around, of course, as they all take thousands and thousands and thousands of years to do so. But it's so huge that we can't see it in one view with our telescopes. Um, and this one is found near Cygnus. This is the first part of it we call the witch's broom. 
easily found with that one finder star. Ah, so this is more a fall uh, sky or even uh, late summer and fall. Um, there might be a few that you'll recognize easily. So that W is Cassiopeia is a pretty common one that it's called circumpolar. So like the Big Dipper, which is only a part of the Great Bear, um, they sit to it towards the northern uh, part of the sky and therefore they never go below the uh, out of season, shall I say. They never go below the horizon. And that great W, my son Wayne thinks that's his um, constellation, but it's actually Cassiopeia. Cassiopeia being the queen of, shoot, um, I get the, I'm sorry, uh, she's a queen. <laughs> I, it's just uh, eluding me right now. Um, and we can use these stars here in Cassiopeia as a pointer to get to this, the Andromeda galaxy. The constellation Andromeda is this slender little triangle that is shared, um, shares this star that is Pegasus, the flying horse. There's his neck and his front legs. Pegasus doesn't have back legs in the sky according to the International Astronomical Union. But um, this is constellation, constellation Andromeda, and there's a galaxy. This you can even see naked eye. Sorry, my clock is gonging. Andromeda is the furthest item that you and I can see with the unaided eye. So Andromeda galaxy is 2.2 million light years away. Um, in other words, the light that we see in our eye when we are looking at the Andromeda galaxy left that galaxy 2.2 million years ago. But it, you have to take a time to digest that thought. It's huge. Originally, it was thought that the Andromeda galaxy was very much like our own. We have since discovered through amazing technologies, that it is at least four times the size of the Milky Way. The two are going towards each other. We are in the same, shall we say, neighborhood. They're called um, in our local uh, galaxy collection. And um, in the foreground, there is a small galaxy. And here is another galaxy. But this is the Andromeda galaxy. So again, you can see the congestion lanes, the spiral arms and that center, that wonderful center. And I think that's the most of what, uh, that would never happen. That's a size comparison. That's a Photoshop size comparison. The moon is never anywhere near uh, Andromeda. I think that's the end of that particular one. I'd like to move on to another one, if I may. That's Any great. questions? <clears throat> Linda, doing? we are at, yeah, halfway point about. We did have a question. Sorry, you may have already answered it, but I'm popping back and forth here fielding different good. things. But Rachel asks, how far away is the Andromeda galaxy? So you may 2. have already answered 2. it. 2.2 million light years. So a light year is around... Uh, it's in our quiz coming up. The answer is nine, is it billion or trillion? You're gonna forgive me, um, kilometers away. Anyway, um, in, in a, I don't do numbers, I do uh, concepts. So forgive me about numbers there on that answer. But what I can tell you is that 2.2 million years ago, that light started traveling to us. So when you uh, understand the speed of light and how far light can travel over the course of a year, which is a long way, a really long way that light travels in one year. But it took 2.2 million years for that light from the Andromeda galaxy to get to our eyes. Many of those items that I showed you are 20, 30, hundreds of light years away, thousands of light years away. So you get the concept that it's all about distance. Um, and um, I hope that answered the question. I think so. Thank you, Linda. <laughs> You're welcome. 
Now the North Bay Club has put together this amazing quiz. I'm gonna see if I can share it. Hmm. I'll try again. Here we go. <laughs> I slipped around here. Uh, there it is. And now I follow their quiz because it's just so plain fun. So forgive us if there's a little bit of silliness involved, but. I think that's, I don't think there's anything wrong with having some fun. It's science is just, science can be really, really fun. So here you go. The sun is a star. True or false. I will um, do my best to do a little bit of teaching as I go through these questions. And I, I'm assuming you all answer this one correctly. In that Oh, I should go back. I wonder if I know how to go back. Can I go back that way? Oh, look at that. Um, the sun is a typical star. It's not a it's not an unusual star. It's not remember, remember how we were only one third of the way in from the far edge of our galaxy that I showed you a picture of a galaxy and said we're we're not all that unusual. Stars, there are larger ones and smaller ones. They have certain ages. Uh, the great big ones tend to um, burn off their fuel really, really fast. Our sun, our star, is a typical average middle of the road star, actually within a middle of its life, of its expected lifespan. And um, so we're not going to witness its death by any means. It, um, of the uh, about 450 billion stars within our own Milky Way. It's known that at least 80% of them have at least one, if not multiple planets around them. So um, we are not all that special. Um, we may be special in the type of life we have grown to evolve into. However, the sun is a typical star, one of many that have planets, and one of a few who sit alone and don't have uh, the not a binary or part of a triple star or multiple star uh, grouping, um, we um, are individuals. So the name of our galaxy, we've already discussed this one. Uh, this picture is again, not of our galaxy, but it is of two galaxies that are colliding and that happens. So there we are, the Milky Way. This I had given you the answer to already. The one that's shown is, by the way, um, M51 at the uh, Whirlpool Galaxy. So, Mercury is the closest planet to the constellations, the moon, the sun, or closest planet to the Metro Grocery Store. Mercury is... Um, Closest to the sun, therefore difficult for us to see because we can't visually, for visual astronomers, because we have to wait until it has gone in its orbital path, which is quite elliptical. None of the orbits are, are circular. So the elliptical orbit does at times get it away from the center, from the sun, because if, the, if Mercury is in front of the sun, we can't see it, or if it's behind the sun, we can't see it, but we sure can see it if it's further away from the sun. So on the horizon, near sunrise or sunset, but never far from sunrise or sunset, we can uh, see Mercury. Hmm. Earth has how many moons? I think that one's pretty straightforward. We have one. Mercury has no moons. Venus has no moons. Mars has two moons. And then when you get out to the gas giants, and you get out to Saturn and Jupiter, Neptune, uh, Uranus, they have multiple moons. In fact, Saturn is certainly at currently the king of the moons and was recently uh, found to have 82 moons. So they don't all have the same number like we do. Can you put the planets in size from biggest to smallest. 
I'm hoping you can see the ones in yellow there. There's Earth, Uranus, Jupiter, Saturn, and Neptune. Which one is the largest and which one is the smallest? So we'll give the largest one number one. So it says that Jupiter is the largest one, and it certainly is. And it's very bright in the night sky. Saturn is quite large. It's also a gas giant, but has far less mass than Jupiter does. Uranus, again called a gas giant. And Neptune. Uranus and Neptune are not visible by the uh, unaided eye, but they can be seen by binoculars if you know where to look for them. Beautiful, beautiful uh, shades of blues. One is a blue green, one's what robin egg blue. But Jupiter and Saturn are easy to see with the naked eye, and we see them predominantly in the night sky um, this summer. We saw them last summer, and we get the pleasure of seeing them again this summer. And Earth is the smallest one of that list. There you go. Take a moment and put the planets in order from the sun. And forgive me on number C there, but that's that North Bay group. Have you decided which one it is? Here we go. So there we are. Now the reason Jupiter, okay, so Mercury, I said we don't see very much because it's so close to the sun, we'd have to be looking towards the sun in order to see Mercury. So again, it just sits low on the horizon whenever we get to see it. Venus, we do get to see far more often. And because of its significantly ecliptic, um, not circular, but ecliptic uh, path around the sun, we often get to see it in the bright sky or in this very bright in the night sky. And because it's closest to the sun, none of the planets make their own light. I'm hoping that that part comes across for you. Um, the light that we see when we see one of the planets is simply reflected light from the sun. And because Venus closer to the sun than any of the other planets for us it's really bright mercury is small it's close to the sun but it's small the sky is very light like it's still uh it's not really really dark uh, so we don't see mercury well but venus we see quite bright and then mars is fairly bright for us to see it but the sun has the sunlight has traveled from the sun to mars to back to us been some loss, but Jupiter is huge. So the light travels from the sun to Jupiter and back to us. It's bright in the night sky. Saturn, less slightly less so. Again, Uranus and Neptune so far out that we don't see them without helping our eye to collect the light. And that's why you need binoculars or a telescope. And then Pluto, well, some of us still like to consider Pluto a planet. Um, He's actually been demoted to the title of dwarf planet, which is a whole other subject. How long does it take Pluto to orbit the sun? So dwarf planets are definitely items. He didn't get demoted and forgotten. He's simply um, considered a dwarf planet and not a full planet um, status. And we had to do that when we realized how many other stars have planets around them. So the definition of planet had to change when technology improved and we saw that there were planets, what we call exoplanets, planets around other stars or other suns. And Pluto was um, discovered uh, around, and I may be wrong, uh, uh, 1928, 1938, in that region. And Pluto hasn't traveled very far in that short time that we've known, and I'm saying short time, that we've known Pluto. So if I have I given you a hint as to how long it takes Pluto to orbit the sun when you look at the answers? Here goes. So a year is measured in Earth time. A year is how long it takes the Earth to go around the sun around and back to the same spot again. So 248 of our Earth years 
it takes Pluto to have one year where it has traveled around the sun. Pretty big, long trip, eh? Jupiter, the brightest planet in the solar system. Oops, I may have told you this. So Venus is the brightest simply because it's closest to the sun. However, yes, and you can see them in the daylight. So if you have, remember what I mentioned about those computerized telescopes? Um, we had one set up uh, at halfway late just a couple of years ago. And one of our uh, astronomy guys, our gurus there, he, uh, he said, you know, Venus is visible just now. We should be able to find it. Let's have a look. And so that telescope was well aligned, properly aligned. And we looked up the right uh, position for where it is in the sun. And son of a gun, we managed to find it in the night sky with the telescope or the, in the daytime sky with the telescope. Now, I mentioned location. Location in the sky uh, follows a grid in the same way that on Earth there are the imaginary lines of latitude and longitude. And for the night sky maps, there are imaginary lines that are called right ascension and declination. And um, so we are able to, to find things, uh, the very bright stars, for example, and Venus is another very good example of things that we can find in the daytime sky if we know what position to look for. Every leap year on February 29th, we get to see the back or the dark side of the moon. Is this true or false? But when you look up at the moon, you usually see these seas. They were thought to be seas but way back when. Um, and they are most of them are thought to be um, beds of lava, uh, however long ago solidified. And then the brighter stuff is more recent impact craters with, their, with its ejecta. But do we ever get to see the back or the dark side of the moon? Say, for example, on February 29th. And the answer, of course, is false. The moon is what we call uh, tidally locked. We only see this face of the moon. That faces us all of the time, faces Earth all of the time. So depending on its position from the sun, it will be lit in different ways. So it'll be lit on one side or the other, or fully lit, or maybe the, it'll, maybe the moon will be between the Earth and the sun, and we won't see, we'll only see darkness, and we won't actually see up the face of the moon. But that side of the moon is always away from Earth. And this side of the moon is always facing Earth. It never twirls so that we can see the back side of the moon. So the only way to see the far side of the moon is to be in a spaceship of some sort and be up on the other side of where the moon is. So further away from Earth and the moon. When we speak of distances in astronomy, we started to talk about this already. We talk of objects being so many light years away and how far is a light year? I may have given you a hint already. I, I have trouble remembering billions and trillions because to me, it's all huge. In a year, nine trillion kilometers. Wow. So it's just too huge for my brain to go. To give you an idea of our closest star. So if our sun is a star and all stars are suns, the closest one, how close is the closest one? And it is um, uh, Proxima Centauri, so, um, and Centauri B, 4.2 light years away. So, the light from our sun would travel 4.2 years before it would hit anything if there was a planet going around that nearest star before they'd be able to see us and vice versa. To give you an idea of distance, and four, if 4.2 light years away is our nearest star, and I say to you that those are relatively close stars, astronomically speaking, and there are 
400, about 450 billion stars in the Milky Way. Are you getting an idea of how huge one galaxy is? One average galaxy is? It's huge. I get lost in those kinds of thoughts. So how many stars are in the Milky Way? Oh, poop. Did I just give you a clue? That was not intended. <laughs> but it is an important feature. So again, if this is a typical spiral galaxy, remember that we're only about a third of the way in from the outer edge of a galaxy. One of 450 billion stars, all, almost all of them, so at least 80% of them have planets all circling around a core. Imagine the mass, the gravity involved in all of that. In what constellation is the North Star? Well, the North Star is not so much a term that astronomers use. We call it by its name. We call it by the name Polaris. Um, and that the pole star changes over time because the Earth wobbles. But for now, the nearest fairly bright star, and it's not by any means the brightest star, it's only the 46th brightest star in the, in the night sky. Um, Polaris is uh, currently the closest star to the um, po North Pole for our planet as we're in our wobble session. And so where does that North Star or Polar Polaris sit? It sits in Ursa Minor. So Ursa Major is the Great Bear or the Big Bear or where the Big Dipper is. And the two points of the outer edge of the, the Great Dipper, point two, Ursa Minor, um, and point two, the North Star. How can astronomers determine the temperature of a star? We didn't talk about much, much about this. I didn't talk about colors of stars much when I, other than when I showed you Arcturus and that there was a blue star. Uh, blue is, tends to be hot, hot, whereas red or orange stars tend to be chillier. And there are, um, the way to remember that is a hot new young star. Um, the best way for me to remember colors are thinking of a campfire. And if you're out camping and you've got a really good campfire going at the center where it's most hot, there's white and blue and purple flame and it's, it's really intensely hot. Whereas you go near the top of your campfire, near the top of the flame, it's still, it's quite orangey. So it would be uh, apparently less hot than it is down in the, in the base where it's blue. But how do astronomers determine the temperature of a star? Because a star is burning gases. So what's happening? And we tell it by the color, of course. We don't put a thermometer out there. <laughs> And there we are. Any questions? How have I done for time? Hi, Linda. So we're just going to, um, because there's a little bit of a lag in the presentation, we'll just give folks a chance to get to the end and we'll see if mm -hmm. any questions come through here. But yeah, you're doing great for time. It's, uh, you're at 11.23, so. Yeah, we're just under an hour right now. Let's see. I think the um, the quiz was well enjoyed, though, Linda. We had some participation in the comment section for sure. Oh, good. Excellent. Yeah, yeah those guys from the North Bay they put together a really good, fun show when when you know when we we I should I, I'm a member of that club. I don't say I don't know why I say they, um, and I love working with them. So those quizzes are fun. They've got a few quizzes and they're all quite similar. And I, so I went through and I tried to pick the one that was best suited, I think, to this group. Um, but that's the one I usually end up falling on back on because it, it is a good fun one. 
So we do have a couple of questions. So we okay. have one that comes from Spark Violet and she says, do the stars move? Constant motion all the time, including our own star. So um, I showed you the picture of the galaxy and how it the, the curved spokes of the wheel are going around around. So all of the stars are in constant motion all of the time. All that heat and mass and gravity are all acting on one another. And it takes, again, do I mix up billions and millions? <laughs> I think mm -hmm. it takes us 22 billion years, 2200 2, billion years for us to travel around our galaxy. I, I may have the number wrong, but yes, it's constant motion. All the stars are moving all the time. Um, wow. there, there's no static anything uh, in all of creation. Pretty amazing, eh? Yeah. It's incredible. We mm -hmm. have another question uh, from Rachel. She says, what's your favorite galaxy to look at with the telescope? Well, first of all, Oh, galaxy, favorite galaxy to look at with the telescope. Oh shoot, there's no favorite. I'm just happy to find one. Um, <laughs> they're not that hard to find. I'm just excited whenever I get to observe, period. Um, favorite galaxy to look at with the telescope. It's more a group of galaxies. I like clusters of galaxies. So they tend to, um, if you look away from the Milky, so consider the fact that the Milky Way is a disc. Okay, consider your hand. And this is the stars moving around, moving around, moving around, okay? So if we're in a position way over here and we can look up or down and not towards the center of our Milky Way, we can see more galaxies, more things further away. Because if we look through the Milky Way, there's lots of dust and gas in the way. But looking up or down gives us a less congested area to go to look through, to look beyond our Milky Way and see other galaxies. So when I look towards Leo, right in the middle of the bottom of the belly of Leo, there is a, um, a threesome of galaxies. There's actually a few more in there, quite a cluster if you've got a really powerful telescope. Looking towards Virgo, the, uh, just above the lap of Virgo, there is an amazing cluster. We call it the, the Virgo uh, galaxy cluster. There are thousands of galaxies visible there. Um, at the tail of the curved end of the tail of Leo, there's what we call the Leo triplet. And they're very famous, those three galaxies together. And I like to hang out somewhere between Coma Berenices and which is just past the end of the tail of Leo, somewhere between Coma Berenices and, and Spica, which is the main star in Virgo. There is so many galaxies that it's overwhelming. Can I pick a favorite? No, sorry. <laughs> Do I pick a favorite um, constellation? No, um, because the night sky changes and there's magic all year round. <laughs> Lovely. We have one more question, it looks like, Linda, uh, from sure. Chantel, and the question is, does our solar system move? Yes, absolutely. So, all the systems are moving. So soul, star, uh, same word. And um, so if I tell you that 80%, at least as far as technology goes, again, we're learning all of the time, but at this time, we, we understand that certainly within our galaxy and, and elsewhere too, it's assumed that um, at least 80% of all, galax or all uh, stars have got planets around them. So they're all solar systems. Does that make sense? A planet, planets around star make a solar system. Within a galaxy, all stars are moving constantly in motion. And planets are moving around those stars in the same way the planets, our planets, our eight that we talk of, are moving around our star and our star keeps moving. So everything keeps moving. Is the solar system moving? Absolutely. It all moves together because we are gravitationally, our planets are gravitationally bound to our star, our soul. Make sense? I hope. <laughs> and we'll end 
on that answer, another question was raised about how fast does it move? Ah, you're giving me numbers I don't know so well. <laughs> <laughs> but those things are measured and they can be found. Um, so again, like we measured the path, uh, how long it takes, how many years it takes for Pluto to travel around the sun. We know how long it takes the, the planets to move around the sun. And depending on where the planets are in their galaxy, or depending on where the stars are in their galaxy, they have different speeds. Um, it was once thought that the speed of a um, star around um, the center of the galaxy moved at a different speed than the ones out in the farthest. So when you're thinking of a game of whip when we're, when we're skating, when we're ice, on ice skates, and the speed is different for those that are further out and those that are further in. Um, again, those speeds change all the time and it has to do with the gravity of its nearest neighbors and it has to do with uh, their mass. So um, things are in constant motion, always affected by the gravity and mass of the items nearest to them and in their region. It's constant motion, constant. Even galaxies are somewhat gravitationally bound to each other. Even galaxies, things that are that far away from one another are gravitationally bound because we have a neighborhood of galaxies. Galaxies tend to be in clusters. Um, as do stars tend to cluster and so on. You've got to think huge, <laughs> got to think big. <laughs> and we do have one more question from Rachel. So she's asking, will you be at half the night again at Halfway Lake? Yes. As a matter of fact, I'm going up on the 22nd. I'll be there for the week in advance. So, um, and I'll be there until the day after. So again, I said earlier, a star party is when star when astronomers get together and we like to increase our numbers of nights if we can to provide a better opportunity to have any clear night. Um, if I'm not mistaken, there's some up there right now at Halfway Lake, some, some of our uh, astronomers. Um, and um, yes, every year, the weekend prior to the Labor Day weekend, so not Labor Day weekend, but the weekend prior to the Labor Day weekend, the astronomy, the local astronomy club gathers uh, up at Halfway Lake and we have what we call a star party for the public. And usually in non-pandemic times, we'll have lineups of a couple of hundred people around our telescopes down at the boat launch on any given clear night. Wow. Um, so half the night star party is simply Halfway Lake uh, the weekend prior to the Labor Day weekend, every year we have an agreement with that park and we go up and we love to share with the campers there. And obviously your person who asked the question um, has met us up there before. And like other campers, like many other campers, they do um, book their time planning, knowing that we're going up there every week. I've been going up there for, well, close to 15 years doing astronomy, but um I've been doing that park for close to 40 years. So I'm wow. very familiar with it. It's near and dear to my heart. But we do, most of our star parties are on what we call new moon weekends through the summer. So from the end of April to early October, all new moon weekends, astronomers are busy out uh, doing our programs in different provincial parks. However, half the night is never about the moon phase when there's no moon to interfere with the light in the sky and, and gives us a dark sky. We don't care about that. At half the night star party, we go regardless of the moon phase and have that particular weekend up at the halfway lake. Yeah. That's fantastic. So uh, we just have uh, Patricia Lego says, see you there. And it's- Oh yes, of course, Patricia. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> She's in there every year for five years, she says. Yep. Um, yep. One of my members uh, also attached to Girl Guides, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Uh, so we do have one more question comment. So on August 11th, there is supposed to be a meteor shower, or at least that is what I've heard. Yes. The Perseid meteor shower peaks August 11th, 12th this year. However, there are meteor showers every month. Sometimes there are two meteor showers every month. Um, but the Perseids are best known uh, for the public. And I think that's just because we are often on summer vacation and can take the time to um, stay up later at night 
Um, and it's not as cold as watching the ones that the Geminids, for example, that happened in de late in December. Um, those are very chilly to watch. So it's warmer to watch the Perseids. Um, but you can go out. I have found wonderful views of uh, those meteors that happen uh, attached to all a part of the uh, Perseid meteor shower for a good week and a half or two weeks going into, so in advance of. So right now you can see Perseids uh, at night and then a week and a half or two weeks coming out of the, from the peak of the, that meteor shower. So um, you don't have to go out just on peak night. And if, my first year doing all of this, I did book my vacation for peak night. I wanted out and we had a clouded out night. I mean, welcome to my hobby. It was fully overcast and we saw nothing. Um, but going into for quite a while, you can see beautiful Perseids at night. So, and how the meteor showers get their name is they appear to radiate the shooting stars, the meteors, appear to radiate from a specific spot in the sky, a, a specific area ruled by that particular constellation. So if you were to draw a line following the path, use your word, the vector, follow that vector back from the path of whatever uh, meteor that you see in the next few weeks, you'll most likely reach right back to the part of the sky where the constellation Perseus is. And that's how a particular meteor shower gets its name. So this is called the um, Perseid meteor shower. Yes, it does peak, but I don't bother to go out and peak night. I'll be going out every night in the next little while to look for them. They're beautiful. And naked eye, no binoculars. Naked eye, completely naked eye. Fantastic. So I'm just going to refresh the page one more time here. And let's see if there's any other questions and it doesn't look like it Linda but okay uh, just one second I think that's it but we do have some great comments wonderful information and and again on behalf of the library thank you so much for your presentation Linda this has been uh, a highlight, I think, of our summer reading club and uh, just great accessible information and for myself as well. And uh, for everyone else out there, uh, we look forward to hopefully hosting the Linda and the Royal Astronomical Society at the library for in-person events in the future. Mm. So uh, Linda and I are going to be chatting about that and we hope to see some of you who are tuning in today there at our branches when we return um, to in-branch programming in the future. Um, but yeah, thank you, Linda, so much for being here today. You're welcome. I love doing it. I miss doing it with the crowds. <laughs> well, you're a great teacher and so many great, um, so many great relatable kind of focal points in your presentation. So I think everyone uh, really appreciates that. Okay. So see you later, everyone at home. I'm going to stop the live stream. <laughs>